Okay. So um, my name is Courtney Dunkerton. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Human Trafficking Program Coordinator for NC CASA, and I will be your trainer today. Um, accompanying me is my colleague, Deanna, and I will let her introduce herself. Good morning, folks. Uh, Deanna Harrington. I am the Director of Member Services, Training and Technical Assistance here at NC CASA. My pronouns are she, her. I will be manning the, manning the chat the best that I can today. Um, in addition to, if you have any tech issues, you are welcome to place that in the chat or I'm gonna place my email in the chat that you can also reach out to me via email if you're running into any issues. Um, I will stay muted and off of my camera throughout the training, um, but of course I encourage you all to turn yours on. Um, and it's glad to see so many folks show up for a, what is gonna be a really great training. Thanks. Thanks, Deanna. Um, and then Deanna will be at, at different points uh, bringing to my attention any questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen, so I won't be looking at the chat um, hardly at all, but feel free to use your um, raise hand feature or um, you can reach out directly to Deanna. If you, if, you, if you reach out to me in the chat, I may not, it's very possible I won't see it immediately. So um, we have a great group of folks. I'm so excited you're here. So um, I'd love to uh, hear who you are. Um, if you want to change your Zoom name to reflect your pronouns or agency. And also if you're comfortable to share some of that information in the chat where you're from. I know we had some folks register kind of all over the country. So if you're here, we'd love to hear where you're from. And while you're doing that, I am going to um, share a little bit about NC Casa. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Oops, this one. All right. So the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault is an inclusive statewide alliance working to end sexual violence through education, advocacy, and legislation. We uh, use an inclusive state, we are a st inclusive statewide, I just read that y'all, sorry. We are a statewide coalition and use a social justice framework. So our work is done from a strong intersectional social justice perspective. So when we center our work around marginalized communities, everyone is served. Some of our hey, work- Courtney, it's yeah. Deanna, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, your, what, when we're seeing your screen, we do not see the slideshow. It's just popping up one slide at a time and your slides Strange. are not advancing. Strange, okay, hold on, let me, huh, okay. Let's see what's up with that. Yeah, something is just, it's kind of strange. Um, what do you see? Um, so we see your entire computer share. So we see every tab open. Okay. Um, okay. Your training there? presentation is open, um, but it's, still like it's okay so i can see your arrow go to um view Oops. hold on like something is literally hold on okay mm -mm. Uh, deanna why don't you Like, sorry, y'all, this like rarely happens. Yeah, that's no problem. I'm I gonna, literally I'm, don't even know what's going on. Hold on. I'm going to pause my recording, folks, and okay. um, I'm going to pull up and share my screen of the presentation. So thank you for your patience. And sponsor strict statewide trainings related to sexual violence. We are involved in a um, resource sharing project and technical assistance. We work uh, within a legislative and policy change on the local and national level. We are involved in anti-human trafficking outreach, training and technical assistance, prevention education, training and technical assistance, and work on colleges and universities. And just to acknowledge at the beginning, not all women are perpetrators, 
Not all women are victims, not all men are perpetrators and any gender can be a victim. Any gender can be a perpetrator. So this training is part of the equipping program at which the vision is to serve survivors of human trafficking with evidence and survivor informed practice with healing centered engagement. And this program includes print and digital resources and annual learning cohort um, training on innovative and research based practice and year round technical assistance. We just completed our um, January learning co cohort and are going to do another one in June. Um, and I bring to this program uh, over a decade of experience in direct service program development and training and working with child and adult survivors of human trafficking. So uh, no doubt you've already, you're already aware that this material is fairly heavy. Um, so just encourage you to be comfortable and take care of yourself and engage as you feel comfortable. Um, we understand that there are likely survivors in the room. So we want to um, practice that awareness as we interact and an encouragement to keep uh, personal stories in this space. Um, content warning, we're going to be talking about uh, child sexual abuse and suicide. And just encourage you also to plan uh, now to have um, a, a break at the end of the training to do something. I already plan to step outside, enjoy the sunshine, and also to check on my cat. So literally that is on my schedule as soon as this training is over. Okay, so we're gonna, we have a couple of polls and Deanna's gonna launch the poll. This isn't to, to answer in the chat, but I wanted to give you the questions ahead of time. So Deanna. Thanks. So there are four questions. Does your agency or organization directly serve minor victims of human trafficking? If you know, um, have you, if so, have you been aware that their traffickers were family members? Um, how many years have you been in direct service? And then describe your current understanding of familial trafficking. All right, just wait a few more minutes. Okay, it's looking like about half of you have participated. We'll wait a couple of, a half a minute or so. Okay. I'm waiting for the participation to get up above 75%. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, we'll stop there at 72%. We'll end the poll and share results. Let's see, okay, so 70% um, yes um, for direct service, 7% no, 22 unsure. Um, were you aware that traffickers were family members? 52% um, yes. Um, 33 no and had suspicion. Thank you. And then how many years um, doesn't apply? Let's see. And then 41% two years or less. 
19, three year four, and then 15, five plus years. Great. In your current understanding. Okay, very little, somewhat. Well, sounds like we've hit a really good um, sweet spot as far as our audience. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much for participating in that. All right. So our learning objectives for this training is by the end of the training, you'll understand the typology of familial trafficking, especially as it compares with non-familial trafficking. Um, you'll be able to identify ways to serve adult survivors of familial trafficking, and you'll be able to use current research to educate community stakeholders and child serving agencies on familial trafficking. So the training content, this will be um, a lot of information. I'm just gonna tell you this up front. Um, I don't always train um, with this much, but I wanted to really bring to you all very current research on the topic. So this will take up the most of our time. Um, I'll be drawing from a lot of uh, so resources that we will share at the end. Um, so the first part will define familial trafficking. We'll look at key research discuss risk factors, system, consider system intersections and health impacts. And then we'll look at some program recommendations from that research. And then the second part, we'll apply some of that in talking about serving adult survivors of familial trafficking and educate your, um, educating your community. So some, I'm sharing this now just to, because I know a lot of research, a lot of information can be overwhelming, but if you, if your program, if you all have these three key pieces of research, uh, resources, it will help you, it will serve um, uh, your community well. Um, the first one is a really great two-pager, very easy to read. Um, you'll be able to use this um, for community education. It's perfect for a variety of stakeholders. And then um, the second one is a good narrative that gives a really good summary of the problem. It's almost like a, it's not a blog, but it's a short article by one of the main researchers. And then this larger uh, research piece is absolutely excellent. This will be something that you can share with um, healthcare providers and those who are um, engaged in um, uh, therapy, behavioral health, et cetera. So those are the three key pieces that we're gonna, um, that you can use. So let's talk about um, what is familial trafficking. Um, so it is, it is a subset of human trafficking. It's a subset of sex trafficking of minors. So it's commercial, it involves commercial sex uh, with a victim who is younger than 18 years of age. We, were, we understand that um, anyone under 18 years of age cannot consent to commercial sex and force fraud or coercion does not need to exist or be proven for it to be considered sex trafficking. Um, we know that some sex trafficking of minors involves just, just the, the minor themselves negotiating their own transactions, right, directly. Sometimes people call that survival sex. And then another kind of sex trafficking of minors involves a third party or, or more than, more than uh, a, a larger group of people. So familial trafficking fits under that type of, of sex trafficking of minors. So it is a third party facilitator. And so this type of trafficking occurs when a family member gives offenders sexual access to victims or um, creates child sexual abuse materials in exchange for something of value. And some people consider the production, the product itself of the, the um, sexual, child sexual abuse materials as something of value. So just giving you that information. Um, so this, so you see how this fits into the human trafficking, larger human trafficking framework. So um, you can share in the chat or just think about this. Why does it matter that we distinguish familial trafficking from other forms of commercial sexual exploitation of children. And Deanna, if you wanna share any, any responses in the chat. I mean, does it matter? Do we need to be this specific, you know, are we just creating more problems? Uh, is more, more complexity, more difficulty? Why is it important?
if anyone wants to unmute and share. And if, if you don't, that's fine. Brittany, also, Brittany, yep. Brittany shares there are unique risk factors. Brianna says the victim is going to have, sorry, they're coming in kind of quick now. Oh, okay. <laughs> a different, different trust issues as a result compared to someone trafficked by a non-family member. Margaret says it is important because it's the truth as opposed to myth. Brittany says um, there are also unique consequences in dealing with recovery. Excellent. No, that's awesome. So it does have a different, uh, different indicators, different challenges and dynamics, and def definitely different treatment models, right? Um, and there's some features of it that are very different. So Margaret, I appreciate you mentioning um, it's real instead of myth. It's also very uncomfortable to talk about. It really is. And sometimes that keeps us from really wanting to face, um, you know, what's going on. And we have to be take care of ourselves in that. But it is, it's, it's really tough material. Um, so thank you for that, y'all. And um, if there are any questions regarding the definition, please share those. So um, this is not an exhaustive list, but based on uh, research and um, some of some of my own experiences working with survivors, here is a sort of a snapshot, a typology, if you will, um, various ways uh, it occurs and common characteristics. So this is would be where parents allow others to pay to sexually abuse their children for drugs, money, a place to stay. Research show that shows that parents using children to obtain drugs is the largest category of this. Um, it can be when uh, someone sells, a family member sells their child to a trafficker. They can sell their child to another person for marriage, um, to, to, ma to marry them, legal, legally marry them, um, but the parent is selling their child. So that's the trafficking. Um, intergenerational transmission of sex work. And I want to be really careful about this because we do not want to stigmatize sex work. Um, that it doesn't need any more stigmatizing, but we need to provide a complete picture around this situation. So this would be um, one study of a sample of adults who were um, involved in commercial sex. Of those, that group, 35% of that group had first been involved in commercial sex before the age of 18, and they had other family members engaged in sex work. So we're not saying it's a cause, we're just saying this is this is the landscape, this is part of their experience. Um, so parents producing child sexual abuse materials, um, one study of 150 adult survivors who indicated um, they appeared in sexual abuse materials as children, 42% of those folks identified their biological or adoptive stepfather as the primary offender. Um, so we're finding that as far as child sexual abuse materials, it would be the father or the boyfriend of the mother that's the primary trafficker. And in other cases, it will be the mother. We'll talk about that more. In all of these cases, the child is residing at home during the time of exploitation. Um, and technology facilitated CSEC is, it refers to when individuals use information and communication technologies to engage in human trafficking and related behavior. So these are expressions of <clears throat> of familial trafficking. And again, it's not exhausted. And the pollen is making my throat scratchy, so I'm probably going to be drinking a lot of water, FYI. <clears throat> so how, you know, how, how often does this show up? How big is this problem? Well, I just want to make a, a, a quick mention about the prevalence of child sexual, uh, commercial sex. Um, sexual exploitation of children, we don't really have accurate numbers, right? There's a really great article that it will be in your resource list that discusses that um, um, little research has accurately estimated the number of, um, of domestic minor sex trafficking cases in the United States. Um, so I just wanted to name that. We're also seeing that familial trafficking may account for around 40% of all CSEC cases. If that's the case, that's a pretty big deal. And so that, that saying that I wanted to go through some of these, some of these numbers for you, because um, that really got my attention when I was researching this. 
Um, the counter trafficking data collaborative that's operated by the Institute of Medicine reports that almost half of child human trafficking cases began with some family member involvement. Um, this this uh, organization reports that 36% of human trafficking cases, the child was intentionally sexually exploited by family members looking for some kind of payoff. In a survey of child serving professionals who worked with at risk youth, um, said the largest category of victim trafficker relationships um, they had worked was a family member. So that is a significant number too. Um, and the OTIP sheet that I, sh I shared with you earlier um, has 31 or 41% of all CSET cases are, familial, are family involved. Um, and then when one considers child sexual abuse material, um, the National Incident Incident-based reporting system um, reports that 25% were, were family members of uh, family members were the offenders. So, um, and a lot of those materials have been found to be produced at the child's at the family's home. Okay. Any questions or comments, Deanna? I'm currently not seeing any in the chat. Okay. And those things that I mentioned will be shared on that resource page. So I want to have a little discussion about this, um, talking about the push and pull factors. So this is a quote from one of the researchers, poverty, socio-environmental stressors, and the opioid epidemic have created an environment of desperation in many Kentucky families leaving some children youth vulnerable to this form of sexual exploitation. And in this, they were referring to some Appalachian cultures where this was found to be common. Um, before we discuss this, I have to name the racialized war on drugs and the ongoing structural racism of incarceration policy and practice that coexists alongside of language and framework around the opioid epidemic. So that's just really important for us to consider and remember and name as we are talking about this. So when we think of, of this, this comment, you know, we're, we're going beyond the actual act of the child being trafficked. We're pulling the lens back and looking at these other things that are contributing to these, uh, these large percentages of numbers. Um, and also in my own work with many of you who have shared with me um, that drug facilitated sex trafficking of minors has increased over COVID because many reasons, the um, um, housing insecurity, food insecurity, and also more people are online. Um, this discussion goes far beyond keeping a child safe online, right? More people are online, more children are online constantly but this is bigger than just, oh, keep, keep yourself safe from a predator. So, so let's talk about this. Um, I'd love to hear what community-based solutions come to mind for you, but also your, your responses to this. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can have a discussion. And I'm gonna pause the recording my screen. Okay. okay. All righty, so we're going to talk about um, system intersections and this is, um, you'll see some differences um, with uh, between familial trafficking and non-familial traffic in this and I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, so and as we go through this, do, do think about the differences. Um, so while all, a lot of cases had child welfare involvement, um, most of these had a primary finding of neglect and a very few finding or a substantiated sexual abuse finding. So um, that is really, really important. Um, there um, is a history of presenting at health and emergency de departments with sexually transmitted diseases and injuries, or um, in, that's not uncommon. Um, one study talks about the most frequently um, when a child was identified as being trafficked by the family, 
they were most frequently preceded, it was most frequently preceded by a report from the hospital emergency room, a report to Child Protective Services, or it was a report from law enforcement that this was uncovered during a police investigation. So that's, um, that's significant as well. Um, one study in six cases, multiple emergency room visits yielded no noted suspicion of sex trafficking or subsequent referral. Um, in many of the cases, the law enforcement investigation revealed the drug-related activities, and then they were able to connect the dots to the familial trafficking if they had that, that awareness. Um, only two cases in one study involved runaway behavior by the child or youth, though 86% involved truancy or excessive absences from school. Very, very significant difference here. So you have truancy and absences, but you don't have the running away. And so when there is running away, that child is going to be exposed to different, more, more systems, right? Than just not showing up at school. So I think that is a very significant difference in familial trafficking. And you see how it can be um, missed. Um, Youth in one study were involved with multiple service systems during the time the trafficking was occurring. Most of it community mental health, health care, child protection, and juvenile justice. Um, contact with homeless shelters or other social service organizations as runaways, if they were runaways in the few cases. In one study, children were less likely to be involved with law enforcement and more likely to be identified by non-criminal justice, such as health care providers, schools, or child welfare. Um, youth were slightly more, for those that, that had law enforcement involvement, youth were slightly more likely to be classified as victims and less likely to be classified as delinquents. So um, that is significant. Any comments or questions around that? And what, what comes up for you, those of you who have been doing this work? Okay, I'm seeing a quote from a comment from Margaret. Basically any community service that helps address social vulnerabilities of any kind are also working to prevent trafficking. Absolutely, thank you, Margaret, for including that in our discussion um, about environmental factors. Exactly. Preventing human trafficking is so much more than, again, trying to help kids make the right decisions, right? It's so much more. It involves um, our entire culture, our entire ecosystem, our social, um, emotional environments. So thank you. All right, so we'll continue on. Courtney, you do have a, a comment in the chat from Nicole. Um, okay. The question is to clarify, the children referred to CPS that are victims of familiar trafficking are referred because of neglect. Referred, that was the, substan in one study, that was, you would have a, a substantiated, um, the referral would be substantiated, it would be neglect. Um, other than um, sexual abuse or physical abuse. So they would be presenting with um, neglect. Is that clear? And, Br and Brittany says, okay, so in reference to that question, mm -hmm. um, the response back, so they were identified by their foster families? That's, um, uh, I'm not sure about that, but this is just, okay. In one study, while all the cases had child welfare involvement, 93% had a primary finding of neglect, while only three cases had a sexual abuse finding. So it, it doesn't mean that sexual abuse wasn't occurring, but it was neglect that was substantiated. So that's, that's significant. So, so however that report came to CPS, it could be from a number of things. Courtney, can you hear me? Yes. So I come from a background of working as an investigator. 
um, but prior to my current job and in our experience proving um, sexual abuse or human trafficking was so difficult and families are so good at covering things up that if we can't get what law enforcement or the judicial system would consider an airtight disclosure, um, then there was no way to substantiate on the abuse. And the only thing we could do was sub on neglect mm -hmm. for whatever else you might be seeing going on in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times you would not end up removing the child from that situation either. So it's the system all around is um, deeply broken. Mm -hmm. but there are things so much red tape that would prevent the subbing on the abuse. Amber, I am so glad you said that. <laughs> I am really grateful because we can be so hard on the criminal legal system for this, right? And why didn't they, you know, why didn't they charge human trafficking? Why didn't they charge child sexual? It is so hard and it's easier. And also you might have a DA that says, we're not charging this. We're only going for, like you said, the airtight, what we can absolutely prove, right? And I can tell you, and Amber, you, I'm sure you can as well, you know that that mama is trading the baby for drugs. You know, you know, but you, you cannot prove that commercial aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone in the housing, con the, the boarding house may know this is what this mom is doing to her kid but how to prove that commercial exchange when there's no written record, it's, it's drugs, it's not, money's not being changed. So it is really, really difficult. So, um, so that's why, that's why we can't just rely on those systems to identify these kids, right? Um, Amber, you want to say anything? You want to follow up anything I just said? <laughs> Cause I'm so glad you're bringing this into the space. Um, no, I think we've both really hit on it. It's just there's so many different policies and procedures, even the way that a DSS investigator proceeds versus how your sheriff's or police department investigators have to proceed. They don't always go hand in hand. Um, sometimes a kid will you know, lose track in an interview and they're just kind of done because they're four or five years old and they just start saying some random stuff because they're uncomfortable. And that can kill a case right there. And you can't blame a child for that um, by any means. But there's so much red tape that can prevent you from going through and actually charging these things and getting the kid out of that situation. And unfortunately, a lot of times you would hear within CPS, close it, maybe we'll get it next time. Right. Which is not to say those those reports are still important because they're building a case. They're building files, right? Just Absolutely. because you report that, and that is significant. So if you suspect child abuse, report it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, when you're just relying on disclosure, those forensic interviews have to be conducted in a way that you're not leading the child and it has to be, you know, used in a court of law. And, the, and if you're just relying on the investigation and a child's disclosure, it is very, very difficult, which is why the whole community needs to be engaged in these things, right? Um, so, Courtney, this is Deanna. We've got mm -hmm. quite a bit of comments in the chat, so I don't know if you want to oh. stop your screen share to take a look okay. at those, or would you like me to read them out to you? Why don't I stop my screen share? Okay. And, okay, cool. And I can, I can share my screen. All right. So we will... And that's why when we do these trainings, we encourage people, if you are involved with children, being a safe, supportive adult means more than you will ever realize. You don't know if that child is, is being harmed some way, but you are a safe person for that child to be around. So whatever system you're working in, whatever role you have in the community, if you're around children, and anyone for that matter, right, that's what being trauma-informed is about you are a safe supporting person. And they can, even if it means just being able, if a child can just be calm and, and relaxed just for a few minutes every day in your presence, it really does provide that protective factor and also encourages um, disclosures. It can, and a person can say, well, I know that there are nice people out there that will listen to me and believe me. So I might now decide to speak to Aunt 
my auntie about this thing, right? Um, so yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some health impacts um, uh, around familial trafficking. So some of these would not are not going to be surprising. Sexual assault is definitely child sexual abuse. Witnessing violence of another, um, physical assault, health related crisis such as contracting an STI, pregnancy, injury. Some of these children have multiple pregnancies, um, and the the healthcare provider may really suspect something going on, but again cannot prove it. It might be the parent themselves bringing the child to receive um, reproductive care. And again, there's no proof involved. That's why we're gonna talk about screening in a little bit. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder was the most common diagnosis followed by oppositional defiant disorder, major depressive disorder. Um, and I'm quoting here the psychological and social damage um, um, this type of psychological and social damage inflicted by parents or other relatives exploiting children in commercial sex may even be more severe and enduring. And there is, um, if you're aware of be be betrayal trauma is um, a type of trauma that occurs when you have people close to you who, um, who are betraying their role of a protector and a provider, right? And of course, family would parents would fall into that type of trauma. So um, households in which children are exploited in commercial sex by family members are likely to have multiple adversities, dysfunctions, and stressors that create a household dynamic of coercion and chronic stress. Um, Vanderkolk, you know, the, the author of The Body Keeps the Score stated when trauma emanates from within the family, children experience a crisis of loyalty and organize their behavior to survive within their families. And that we know that this dynamic occurs in family violence, other types of family violence. Children who experience this form of trauma exposure can have difficulties with self-regulation and social interpersonal relatedness. And many experience short and long-term problems such as physical and psych psychiatric disorders, addiction and addictions, okay. Um, and this next slide is gonna discuss suicide. So I just wanted to, um, to share that. Um, so over one third of one sample, um, I had mentioned this before, the child had a psychiatric hospitalization subsequent to the trafficking and almost half in this case reported that they had attempted suicide during their sometime during their, their whole lifetime. One finding um, uh, concerning, particularly concerning finding is the prevalence of reported suicide attempts in over 50% of a particular sample a study compared to the national statistics that places um, that places adolescent suicide attempts at the rate of eight to 10% in the general population. So this rate is extremely high. Um, and that honestly is what one of the things that caught my attention when doing this. If this is the case, then we really need to look into this. Um, the high rate of suicide attempts suggests that the young people in this study were experiencing considerable suffering associated with their life circumstance. The severity of abuse in this particular sample is very high with very young age at first exposure of that abuse. Um, and I'll just end with this, this part with this quote. Um, Castle, and this is an old quote in the New England Journal of Medicine, posits that suffering that leads to suicidal behavior is often preceded by a threat to the person's existence or integrity or attempts to maintain his or her role in their family or society or an assault to the individual's sense of self or identity. From a developmental perspective, children and youth who are exploited by their parents and family members have encountered an experience that fulfills each of these requirements and during a time when they may not be cognitively or emotionally 
capable of extracting themselves from the situation. The fact that almost 60% have ongoing contact with their trafficker speaks to the difficulties these children and youth may have in protecting themselves from ongoing exposure to the perpetrator of the crime against them and represents an enduring threat to their psychological and physical safety and also who they must rely on for their survival. So we know from, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna go into a dissociative identity disorder, but what we do know of it, it's formed at these young ages. So we can take a look at that and consider that as well. Okay. Courtney, there's yep. a question in the chat. Um, okay. They would like to know where is the quote from that is um, on this slide that's showing. It is during, it, during, it is from the, there's an article, I, I have it at the end, it's during, um, why do I keep saying during? Spring is the author from the Journal of uh, Family Violence. So it's in those resources that I'm sharing with you at the end. Okay, any other questions or comments? Not that I see, they just said thank you. Okay, great. I, um, I just had a I just had a question. You'd mentioned uh, the research um, that was done. I did. I was taking notes. Um, what did the researchers say in terms of um, the children experiencing trauma? What was um, it, what was that comment that you made? Um, the severity of abuse in the sample is very high. Is high. That one, Bet oh, betrayal trauma, is that it? Did I answer your question? When you were speaking about uh, the researcher, Vander, uh, what's oh. his name? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what um, was that? Vander Kolk, yeah, when trauma emanates from within family, the family children experience a crisis of loyalty and organize their behavior to survive within their families. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So we have this dual where the, the child is, and these are, we're talking about in general, young, younger children, like under the age of nine-ish. So we're talking about children who are very dependent on their families, but are also having to find a way to depend on their families for survival, but also to survive their families. So that creates um, a pressure and stress that, you know, um, that, that is, that is significant. Okay. Um, and just to acknowledge, there's no immediate fixes here. Um, and it doesn't mean that all children who survive this are, you know, going to have these things, you know, experience that the, all these outcomes. So there's, there's always hope, but there's, but there's no immediate fix. So I hope this compels us to raise this issue within our networks. Um, and we're gonna be looking at some ways we can take a step, some steps to do that. Any, was there, was there someone that wanted to say something? Okay. All right, we're gonna go on. So findings that impact identification, you probably already gathered, um, you know, just in our conversations, some of what some of those things are. Um, this slide, it just discusses training and awareness. And if you, uh, if you think about it, the literature and training, or you think of images or, or ways we depict um, commercial sexual exploitation of children, usually doesn't depict family members as a trafficker. We might say it, but if you think of the, you know, the literature, it'll explain, it'll describe like boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, um, the Romeo trafficker, the, the gang member, the, you know, but they don't depict a family member. And that would be a horrible picture. Like here's trafficking, here's look, you know, and you've got this, this parent and a child, like nobody wants to put that picture out there. However, as Margaret was saying, this is a real thing, right? We don't want to default to myth or default to something that maybe even race, even our, you know, some of us who might have implicit bias, it's more comfortable to other the trafficker, someone who, you know, but being a, a parent, that's just too, that's just too hard. Let's just, um, let's just, you know, create an image of the criminalized, um, you know, trafficker that fits a, a different description. So um, 
we mentioned that the, the mother is usually the trafficker in these, uh, the drug related situations with the creating child sexual abuse images. It's usually the father, stepfather, or the boyfriend of a mother. Um, often these um, children are younger than those who we generally depict who are being trafficked. So if you think of the 13 year old who's on the streets or doing, you know, engaging in survival sex or the runaway, um, we're talking about little, little children here. Okay, um, and again, the young age of these children may have contributed to the lower instance of running away um, and the lack of involvement in the juvenile justice system. No one's looking for them, right? And this just decreases the provider's opportunity to detect the trafficking victim. So if the only system that they're engaging in is the school system, and then they're, they're absent most of the time, but they're not getting in trouble, they're just gone. You know, they're not involved in anything else. Who's going to, who's going to see that? Who's going to, you know, um, maybe somebody can do, you know, call CPS for a wellness check or law enforcement for a wellness check, something like that. But these kids are just getting missed. They're just getting missed. Um, and, you know, I, one of the kiddos we worked with, um, the mother had said, if you share you know, I'm going to go to jail and you'll never see me again. And that child couldn't handle that. So they kept shut about the trafficking part, shared about other things, but was quiet about the trafficking part. Um, there's a lack of awareness, training, and record keeping around this. Um, okay. The other, um, the other thing that is significant about these studies is um, I don't know if rurality is a word, but I, but I said it. So is the rural nature of some of these things. The majority of cases in these studies occur in mostly rural and some micropolitan areas. Um, and what is, oh, I thought I had it somewhere, a micropolitan area. I had it written down somewhere, thought it was right here. It's, it, it's an area that is, um, I think it's larger, population larger than 10,000 between 10,000 and 50,000. I think that's the definition. I'll find it. I thought I had it here. Um, there's more lack of, there's more, a lack of awareness and training, especially in rural areas. And that's not hard to, to understand. The occurrence of a family trafficking of young children in more isolated and under-resourced communities creates a confluence of risk that may hamper the detection and response to these victims. So not only is a child not missing school, they're in an area um, where there's even less ways to interact and intersect with those child, with those children. Um, some of the safe harbor laws have been implemented before states have trained workers and developed effective protocols to implement them. One study records the very high ratings of the most severe abuse ever experienced and there was a statistically significant difference between the geographic groups on the severity of abuse. So the severity scores were statistically significantly higher in the rural group compared to any other group and there were no there was no differences by gender. Okay so I'll say that again severity of abuse scores were significant statistically significantly higher in the rural group compared to the other groups. So again, that is very alarming, it is very significant and should really catch our attention and ask why. Um, any comments or responses to that? And I know this is, we're, com we're coming towards kind of a, a break, a little big break. <laughs> any comments or thoughts? about the rural, the tendency for these cases to be rural. What do you all think? All right. So they're sharing in this chat, access to treatment is harder in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Anyone or Deanna, you can. <laughs> So things like Narcan are harder to get in rural areas typically, and then prescription options that wouldn't require someone going 
um, and being observed to get treatment every day are also less available to certain demographics. Right, right. I'm, I'm wondering too if um, what I've seen is uh, families uh, can be more transient. Um, so they're moving from state to state, um, sometimes sort of flying below the radar, um, staying more in rural areas where they're kind of um, less likely to be, um, uh, you know, identified. Um, so I, I've seen kind of a pattern with that as well. Mm -hmm. Courtney, Another you're getting, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to let you know you're, you're getting a lot of quite a bit of comments in the chat. So I don't know if you want to stop your screen screen share so that you can address some of these questions or you sure. I can continue to do so. It's up to yeah, you. I'd be happy to yeah, stop share and I'll pause your recording. Share my screen. Thank you for that interaction. So, okay. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to take one minute to just breathe. I'm going to literally take 60 seconds and here's a picture of my cat and I thought it would be a good time to just breathe in and breathe out and think about how soft is that blanket how sleek is her fur listen to her purr see her sides gently rise and fall with each breath feel the soft and warm sunlight and breathe in and breathe out. Okay, I just want to give you a little bit of break. And again, um, it can be, it can feel very overwhelming. Um, and feel, you can feel, we can feel very powerless to change something that has so many pieces to it. But there are some steps we can take, um, small steps if we're in a place that we can do that. So we'll consider some program recommendations um, and then let's, and then we'll talk about some ways to serve adult survivors. So, all right. Deanna, is there anything in the chat that I missed? I was just, I just saw something pop up. Um, just someone sharing um, in response to Melody, Amber said, that's my job as well. That's it. Okay, great. So there's um, three ways here that we can, that, that based on the research, the, the program rec recommendations come from the research, um, the sources that, that I've looked at. So um, future research should focus on how age and rurality function as pre potential predictors or moderators of the occurrence severity and clinical outcomes of exploited children and youth. So we have networking, network access to folks who are researchers, this is something that we can advocate for. Um, treatment, um, we want to emphasize that the need to decisively and immediately respond to establish psychological safety is the very first thing that, that we can do and, and we must advocate for, um, for these kids. Um, systems of care um, that are designed to protect and treat victims of familial sex trafficking must act decisively to respond to this, okay? We've talked about awareness of training. Um, people, we need to understand that familial trafficking is a form, oh, sorry for that typo, is a form of sex trafficking, is a type of human trafficking. And for some people, uh, that is a, a um, I don't know, wake up call isn't the word, but that's something that ups the significance. I mean, it, it shouldn't have to, but, but it does. Um, 
too often, I think people can just look at groups of folks in their community. Well, that's just them. They've always been like that, right? That's just how they do things. But when we say, do you know that's actually human trafficking? What? And I've, I could tell you stories about how that, that, that has happened in my conversations in my community. But for some reason, when you name it a little differently, it can, it can impact people. So that's, that's something that we can do. And understanding too, and if we're, you're part of a child advocacy center, as I was, this, we would deal with this all the time. Some perpetrators groom and manipulate potential partners to gain access to children. So if you go to the child advocacy center symposiums, uh, in North Carolina, we're, you know, you're getting training about this all the time. So you'll have men who will date. Groom, the grooming process is creating a relationship with the mother to gain access to the children. So that um, that happens a lot. And so because of that, and because of parents um, create. Uh, uh, child sexual abuse materials, our programming around parents keep your kids safe is not, you know, we need to thoughtfully adjust that, or we need to thoughtfully include the possibility that parents are not trying to keep their kids safe. They're actually doing the very, very opposite. So um, there is a need for agencies and individuals to acknowledge that family members profit profiting off of or facilitating the commercial sexual exploitation of children is human trafficking. Limited attention has been given to in assessments to the possibility that the trafficker may be a parent and caregiver. Um, and then um, sexual abuse prevention and online safety education programs can't assume parents are protected. These programs should sensitively address the problem of abuse, exploitation and image making by family members. Um, I know that in my own work in teen court in the child advocacy center, we would often, it would often be an aunt or a grandmother that is concerned about the child and her mother, their, their mother's, um, uh, some of this stuff going on, right? So it's not just always parents, it can be a concerned neighbor, it can be aunt, it can be grandmother. So we are wanting to include, so it's just, so when we just do this parent child, right? We're only thinking in terms of the nuclear family. We need to go beyond that. We need to be more inclusive of um, family units um, that do not just include mom, dad, child, right? I hope that I'm making sense. Um, so our programming needs to be, needs to expand to include that. Um, okay, any questions, comments? We're gonna move to screening. All right, so too often child, cases of child sex trafficking, as we said, are labeled as neglect, sexual abuse, or understood as status offenses, hindering appropriate services. So um, um, we want to screen so that or we, there needs to be accurate screening so there can be accurate and appropriate treatment provided adding familial trafficking specific questions to screening, especially as health professionals may, especially as health professionals may be the initial point of contact. So we want to um, think about how important our healthcare professionals are. Now I would say, you know, those of us who are involved in this work, let's just don't come up with some screening questions and start implementing programming. I, this really needs to be done by the professionals and um, how those screening questions would happen. So this isn't a case where we would just start going around saying, hey, parents might be trafficking their kids. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, there also needs to be this nuanced understanding of system involvement. For instance, as we've talked about, these children are less likely to be involved with law enforcement and more likely to be identified by non-criminal justice, such as healthcare providers, right? And child welfare or schools. So schools, child welfare, healthcare providers, those are probably going to be our first responders, in a sense. Um, the other thing, this is kind of interesting. Um, screening for parents' drug use is recommended. This is from another source, but I put in a double-edged sword as long as we're criminalizing drug use. So um, 
one of the, the, the researchers talked about, uh, said it is noteworthy that most of the literature on sexual exploitation and substance dependence focuses on the youth's addiction and the role of illicit drug use by the caregiver is rarely mentioned. Um, this is, and I'm just quoting, parents, especially the mothers who are identified as substance dependent by any agency should be screened for involvement in familial sex trafficking. The screening should include others in the life of the parent who may be exploiting their substance dependence as a way of gaining access to their children. Child welfare agencies have a critical role in identifying parents, children, and youth who have been or at risk of being exploited in commercial sex. Um, those risk, risk factors should be included in formalized sex trafficking screen algorithms during uh, child protective investigations. So, um, so I'm so it's 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 talking about um, a more holistic screening, um, but that can be again that can be a double edged sword because it um, it can immediately stigmatize drug use again. However, when I used to do training in my in my county around this especially for agencies, I would say if there is drug use in a home, particularly opioids, you, you have to consider the children as being a funding source for that to support that use. And this would be for CPS workers or law enforcement, right? But um, so any comments on, or questions around that? Courtney, no there's a feedback. question in the chat. Yep. Um, it's, that is, what are the best available screening tools? So there are very few validated screening tools. Um, when we're talking about children, you know, it depends that Child Protect or DSS has their own standard screening that has trafficking questions in it. Um, there's a see it screening tool that a lot of people use the West Coast see it screening tool. Um, but interestingly, the, the um, a lot of the screening tools that have been used in the past don't include, don't consider parents or family as being traffickers. Um, so that's another conversation, but that's, um, that's, my, that's my, easy, my easy first answer. Are there others that um, have experience in using validated screening tools? And there are others that are agency specific. Um, oh, I can, if you can hear me, I know my audio is kind of funky. Um, I went through a training with heel trafficking, which is entirely about uh, like healthcare provider and human trafficking prevention. And they provided me with a few different screening tools. So I can certainly drop those in the chat. I mean, I trust them because they came from heel, um, but they're, they're not specific to familial trafficking. They're right. just generalized trafficking screeners. Right. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes. Um, um, I'm on their speakers bureau and I, they are like, they're the best. They, um, their uh, work is absolutely top notch. So thank you for sharing that. Courtney, okay. this is Deanna. Um, I just wanted to lift up a couple of pieces while we're talking about screening tools. It's in important to remember that oftentimes these screening tools were created by white heteronormative cisgendered folks. And so they often are not helpful. They can be re-traumatizing for folks who are from marginalized communities, particularly um, black and brown communities and our indigenous survivors. The, the second thing is, if you start screening for these things, how will you make repair to the communities that you have not screened for this before? So how do you own that you've created harm or caused harm? And what are you going to do now that you are providing these opportunities for folks that you did not provide before, particularly for black and brown and indigenous folks. Thank you, Deanna, for bringing that up. Anyone want to comment and re reflect I, on what Deanna was sharing? Mm -hmm. I do, I just want to add to that one of the really important things to keep in mind is people are often quick to want to screen but if you yeah. don't have an appropriate protocol end to end in place with people trained with appropriate communication where everyone understands what they're supposed to do, who to refer to, how to talk to these kids and has communicated with the other organizations they need to interact with, you are not helping. 
or you're offering minimal help. So you have to have a protocol in place um, so that you are not just screening and then being yet another person to let these kids down. If they go through, if they get to the point where they're disclosing to you and then you are not doing anything with that information, you are another person who's failed them. Brittany, I want to jump through the screen and hug your neck. Exactly. <laughs> and too much of this work involves people getting some training and just, this is not the place for a knee jerk reaction, right? This is, this is systems level advocacy where we are, we are elevating this problem and we are going, we are going to go to the people who can, who can help and who can make those, um, those changes, right? We are providing education, right? We're not immediately, now, if you're already working with kids and direct services, yes, you can start talking about that, but put it, throwing together a screening tool could be um, particularly considering what Deanna just shared and what Brittany just shared, we can quickly do more harm than good. And, and also, oh, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, this is Deanna, um, yep. building up what Brittany just mentioned. Um, I, I do think protocols are important, but at the same time, we have to recognize the harm that protocols have caused in communities. Um, Oftentimes protocols, because they're written again by white cisgender folks um, and heteronormative folks, um, they often don't account for the individuality um, and culture. So protocols are great because they give you a roadmap, but there has to also be enough flexibility to um, be able to respond to folks in a one-on-one -on -one type of nature. If you have the right people who've been trained to understand their own biases and who've worked through the messages they have and hold around particular minority and marginalized groups. Thank you, Deanna. I'm looking at the time, so I'm gonna go on. Um, but thank you so much for those very thoughtful um, uh, pieces that you all shared. So, so good, so, so good. So um, to design and provide responsive and effective sexual assault services, it's important to grasp the varied and complex impact of sexual violence. And this is from um, a paper from our research sharing, resource sharing project. We wanna be prepared for these stories. Um, we wanna be not shocked. We want to be aware that adults may be, we're, are just putting some pieces together, maybe through therapy, through their own mem um, memories kind of coming together. Um, we want, we know that many um, child sexual abuse survivors disclose in adulthood. They're the ones that are coming to the rape crisis centers, right? Um, when we see the high proportion of sexual violence committed against children, we understand that if we don't serve this population, we miss helping with at least 70% of sexual assault cases. Um, there is some evidence that childhood sexual violence increases the risk for adult sexual violence and domestic violence, indicating that many survivors seen at rape crisis centers and domestic violence programs are also adult survivors of child sexual abuse. Therefore, it is crucial the advocates understand the dynamics of child sexual abuse and implications for adult survivors. So we wanna be equipped with this understanding. It doesn't mean that we have to go around screening and identifying every type of abuse, but we are aware that this happens. Um, and that, you know, and adult survivors can be healing from these betrayal traumas, who, which involved a significant violation of trust or well-being by individuals or institutions that should have helped them or that harmed them, right? Um, and not just trauma from one person, but all those who looked away, all those who saw it, the family who actively harmed, facilitated, stayed silent, and the people around that, neighbors, you know, all of that adult is working out, right? So we want to be mindful of that. Um, educating your community and we are just about done. Who needs to know about this? Um, anyone, you can share the OTIP fact sheet with anyone. That's that two pager that I'll share with you. Really good summary. You can share the spring articles to community health providers, to um, policymakers. 
And this is super important, human trafficking people. <laughs> we want to cultivate a learning environment, not panic or fear. Help people to connect the dots beyond individual choices, right? We do not want to go out saying this is happening all over the place. It's very likely that this is actually a smaller group, but the outcomes, health outcomes are so significant. I don't know, but we don't want to create panic or fear. We want to educate our community, um, educate people who are in places to provide treatment or to identify, right? Um, if people, here's the thing, if people don't even understand the dynamics of child sexual abuse, it's gonna, it's not necessarily gonna make sense to lead with familial trafficking, okay? If we don't understand the, the dynamics of, of, of family violence, right? It's gonna be hard to just lead with familial trafficking. That is the challenge that us, uh, you know, human trafficking organizations have. We want to build on the understanding community already has. So educate about risk factors through a public health framework. Don't just talk about that one thing, pull the lens back. Um, if you haven't accessed our human trafficking um, uh, infogra prevention infographic and toolkit, we'll be sharing that with you. It is absolute, can you drop that in the chat, um, Deanna? It's actually in the notes on the slides. I encourage uh, you to look at Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, is there any questions? I have one more slide and I'm done. Anything to, anything in the chat? Here's my nice Nautilus. So as we close and we have, a, we have, actually no, we're closing. Um, I just wanna encourage you to not underestimate your power to make another person feel safe. Um, and we all wanna to work together to create safe healing communities where everyone can thrive. And one action repeated over time has impact. And the last thing, we are not here to save the world, but our individual and collective actions mean something. And it means that we are also part of something larger than ourselves. So you all are important and please take care of yourself. And thank you so much for engaging this very difficult topic today. Um, and I hope you are take care and please contact us with any questions um, or whatever support that you need. So thank you. Deanna, anything? Hey there, I'm just um, putting the uh, toolkit infographic into the chat for folks. Okay. Um, just so folks know, um, you will receive a link to complete a 